Hello everyone, this is the Flux Dev meeting, uh, 18th of April. Okay, so just a quick overview where we are with the Flux next release. We are moving forward. We have merged the uh, OCI repository implementation in Helm controller. And Sule has now opened uh, the last major change that we want to make to Helm controller, being able to reuse Helm charts uh, across uh, the same Helm chart across many Helm releases. So with Helm controller, we are getting very close. And well, we heard from Sunny that image automation controller is also ready. I know Sule did some uh, testing and review for that pull request, and I hope to do it also next week and merge it. Yes, on my Maybe. side, it's all good. Cool. One of the things that I've been working on since last night is Kubernetes 130 release. Uh, as we promised, every Flux release must uh, come after the Kubernetes release containing all the upgrades and conformance testing to that release. So I discovered that Kubernetes 130 comes with breaking changes in client Go public interfaces, uh, uh, function interface in Lead in the leader election package has been refactored and renamed, which broke controller runtime, which implements that particular uh, leader election part. So we have two choices. One, postpone flux release until there is a fixing controller runtime for it and uh, release or what I did today was moving the controller runtime dependency to an unreleased version from their main branch where uh, there is a fix for, for the breaking change. Now the problem is with going with a controller runtime I know, uh, build from, from the main branch, I don't know. Lots of things that can happen. Uh, and there are other additions to control runtime besides that uh, particular change. Then we can't pin to that because that one uh, upgrades Kubernetes 130 to an alpha release. So we can't pin to that. Anyway, um, I reached out to the Kubernetes team. There is a pull request to um, patch Kubernetes 130, add back the interface and make it backwards compatible. I know if they will merge it, if they merge that one, then we can just wait for Kubernetes 130.1, which can come this month, next month, we don't know. Um, so yeah, things are not looking good on the Kubernetes upgrade side. So we are going to uh, decide what to do probably next week. If next week things will, um, will now move forward, we will make a final decision, either postpone the release or going with a build from the main branch of control runtime. Um, yeah, that's that's it for me. Stefan, if you go with the main, uh, does it mean you go with a breaking change? The control runtime main branch contains a fix for the oh. breaking change. So we can build Flux. The problem is, is no longer, we can't build Flux with the latest Kubernetes and with control runtime, the previous version the latest stable version, they are incompatible. Mm -hmm. This is a SDK, the, how can I call it? 
This is an internal breaking change in the Go code. This does not affect end users. This is about us not being able to build Flux at all because it doesn't build. I see. So it's not a user facing breaking change, it's a major blocker for everything we can build. I see. Okay. Yeah. That's that's not um, not a concern for for end users at all. The of course the thing is if we can't build flux, we can't release it. So <laughs> we need to delay uh, the release until uh, things are sorted. Right, I see. I thought it's either compatible with one thirty or compatible with the previous versions. But thanks for explaining. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an issue in the SDK in client goal. Oh, talking about breaking changes, we so in Flux 2.2, we moved to the latest version of Customize, which broke some Flux users. For example, people which have uh, customization.yaml with no, with comment without resources or no, no resources at all. And in this next version in Flux 2.3, we are going to restore that functionality, uh, even if customize does not support it. Um, we've seen that people have this kind of workflows where they have a customization.yaml, they have things in there. Um, then they decide to remove them from the cluster without deleting the files from Git or deleting the Flux customization. Um, they just comment out the resources. And customize complains, the SDK, oh, there is no resources, so I will decide to fail the build. But this is a valid use case of using Flux, not necessarily customized, but using Flux, right? You deploy something, you test it out, then you say, okay, maybe over the weekend, I don't want these things to use resources, so I'm going to delete them and re-enable them later on. Um, there was a way of doing it, um, by adding a dummy namespace or, or other things in there, but adding a namespace. And then if you forget to undo that change and you just uncomment your resources, your resources will end up in a different namespace than what you uh, have said before. So the workaround is kind of tricky and, and can cause issues for users. So uh, I decided to implement um, a solution in Flux itself. So Flux will detect that there are no resources and it will uh, continue with garbage collection as if you would delete that uh, directory from Git. So this will unblock everybody that was stuck on Flux 2.1 because they were impacted by, by this change. Let's talk about what's happening with Asia DevOps, shall we? Nicoletta, are you being here? Yes. Dikti, do you want to talk about the plans? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, as we all know, uh, Azure DevOps uh, deprecated the SHA uh, way of authentication. Uh, but like I tried to reproduce that locally, uh, but they have like a brownout window. So things only fail in that window and they're like gradually increasing that window starting from like 30 minutes a day. And as the month progresses, it'll end up being a more uh, outage during the day. So I was not able to reproduce uh, that exact failure, uh, but we are adding like a, a long running test uh, that is able to catch this uh, with the option that will uh, get unsupported soon as well as the uh, supported option uh, which will be uh, SHA2 
So uh, we'll add both of those tests uh, and I have validated manually uh, the workaround that uh, Stefan, you shared uh, on the GitHub issue as well. So uh, we'll do both of that and probably uh, do a doc update soon uh, with the with the correct instructions of how things uh, you know work with Azure DevOps. And we'll have that in our test suite as well so that we continue to uh, test it in the long term. Cool. Yeah, there are so there are two two things here which I'm very concerned about. Um, there are DevOps users which said to me on Slack, it's also on that issue. Also, I found people posting on other Azure forums. So they changed to um, SHA2, the key, and it still fails. So either this is a bug in the brownout detection mechanism that is a SHA2 key and thinks it's a SHA1, which is really bad. <laughs> That's the case. Uh, it's uh, really a uh, Azure DevOps issue. Another thing that I, I've seen that, so there is, in the host key, there is a single host key that serves SHA-1 and two SHA-2 uh, algorithms. Now, so Azure DevOps did not issue a new key. It's the same host key which uh, advertises um, all the SHA version of, of RSA. So it can be that uh, we don't prioritize and we say we have SHA-1 for the host key algorithm. So that's why I added in the, in the migration guide, a patch for source controller where we tell Flux, hey, prioritize the host key algorithms for SHA-2. But looking more into the RSA spec. This is this shouldn't be needed. So I suggest creating a third test on your side that runs continuously with a SHA to key, but without the source controller patch. Maybe that one is not actually needed. And I place it there because I didn't quite understood how Azure DevOps could reject SHA-2 keys. Um, ideally, we, we shouldn't have to have that source control patch because that makes life harder for Azure DevOps users. Instead of just running Bootstrap with a key, now they have to pre-provision the repo put the patch in there and only then run Bootstrap, right? So it complicates the whole the whole process because now you need this special uh, patch. And I'm not, I, I, I mean, I, I'm saying again, reading the, the, the spec and the uh, code, the, the um, SSH implementation uh, in Golang, that shouldn't actually be needed because it's one key, right? You don't have multiple keys in uh, presented at the host in the host key, right? If you had like three keys, then yes, we'll say to Flux, hey, prioritize this one, but it's a single key. So no matter what, we'll just use that key. So why would, would we prioritize something if it's only one key, right? So it really doesn't make sense for me uh, if if that patch is needed or not. So yeah, my, my ask is to, to do a test without it and um see how that goes is the brown down thing running every day yeah i think as per their uh, online article i think they said uh, they'll start with 30 minutes every day to and gradually increase it to like eight hours uh, by end of this month okay and then so Q2, by tomorrow mm -hmm. by tomorrow yeah. you should see it right uh, I think it only happens when we, like I kept that uh, setup running after uh, like adding a source control overnight, but I did not see it happen uh, during the continuous reconciliation as well. So I don't know if it's just something that it checks when it first syncs the uh, repository. 
uh, but yeah, I think the long running tests will hopefully uh, expose some of these issues that we are not able to uh, reproduce ad hoc. So you can set uh, the interval of the Git repository to one minute. I did, yeah. And every minute it will open an SSH connection, right? Okay. So it's impossible not to, if every day it's at least half an hour, yeah. you should see for at least, I don't know, at least 20 errors. Mm -hmm. uh, and source controller should tell you I'm not able to clone or it, it doesn't do a clone. What it does, it, it does a remote LS. It, it uh, asks the server which, uh, which is the latest commit, which is the commit belonging to the head, mm -hmm. right? And the server says this commit. And only if the commit changes, only then source control actually does a clone. But you can't do a remote LS without authenticating to the server. So it definitely has to open a, a connection with it. And Azure DevOps just said, no, this is the wrong key, right? So let me go back and look at uh, the logs history as well. Maybe it's something that fixes itself and it's not showing uh, up. But yeah, let me, uh, I'll go back and double check that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it definitely should show up in source controller uh, logs as errors. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, let me know if you if you see an, any any change in uh, if you see the error first, and if the 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 patch the second one without without uh, having the the source controller patch works or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, will do. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we can we can attempt to find Azure DevOps team as well if we if needed. We get more advice or more details on I don't know when the window is happening or what are they guaranteeing and so on. Maybe you can ask them to for your account to just flip it over completely. And then it will always error out. So you don't have to wait for yep. Uh, 24 hours to get an error. You'll get inst instantly in an error. Like, what will people have next month, right? So we should really find a good solution for them and not have all Azure DevOps people coming screaming at us. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've seen that some people have... So there is another thing. Um, uh, Microsoft is saying we only support RSA, right? In official docs. Well, I found out uh, that DSA is also supported, but the Azure UI does not allow you to upload the key. So you can trick the UI by replacing the prefix with RSA and you can actually upload that key. So uh, I don't know if we should have this hack in our official docs, but it's way better than and then RSA. The problem with RSA SHA2 is that uh, Go the Go language does not support generating these types of keys. It's not supported. That means people can't use a single command flux bootstrap to bootstrap the cluster what they are doing today. So they also have to have a SSH keygen installed. If they are on Windows, probably they don't have that because it's not, it doesn't come with Linux binaries and it complicates the whole user experience of running Bootstrap. And I've seen a lot of people going with Bootstrap. Um, I know, maybe because it allows you to do sharding, it allows you to run at scale, you can customize however you want Flux compared to doing it through the Azure UI. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, the, the other option for users is to switch to HTTPS, which is, in my opinion, way, way better than doing SSH. The problem there, I understood from users that the keys expire very fast. Is that the case? I think by default, you can create like a 30 day uh, path 
it is configurable but i think it uh, by default creates a 30 day and maximum i'm i'm not sure but it is configurable maybe you can increase it but for security reasons i think it's recommended that it is rotated uh, frequently and why are on the ssh keys expiring then why are <laughs> i think a lot of them? yeah a lot of orgs actually don't enable ssh on their orgs and they just do the http s based mechanism okay so maybe we should deprecate ssh altogether for devops maybe that's the best best option and say to users hey we are sorry starting from flux 2.3 you we don't recommend you using ssh you can do it we'll we'll have some docs how they can generate sha2 keys and so on but we should maybe highlight on the website that in in our docs which are about azure devos bootstrap that the supported and recommended way is using fml keys fml tokens with pads and that's that's the best way to do it right that's secure uh there is no deprecation anymore it https uh right and and it's they they need to rotate their keys so maybe we should i know highlight this better also maybe write a small blog post or something uh guiding users towards the best and secure option right exactly. and uh, cool. do you have telemetry stefan on what users are using or do you are just getting this kind of issues through slack there consumer? is no telemetry in flux no <laughs> yeah. CNC project should no. have telemetry <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> Okay, we so definitely okay. don't. No. So we only heard about when people have issues, when something breaks. If we don't solve the SSH thing, and we leave it like it is broken, we'll we'll figure out how many users are because they will come screaming. Uh, that's the only way you can tell how many there are using something when that something breaks. <laughs> Makes sense. That's it. One other interesting thing, right? We start switching to Microsoft Go for some other internal projects. And with that, we, we are running into breaking changes for encryption algorithms or an unsupported encryption algorithms, the ones which are coming with the Go toolkit. Um, have you seen the same? Because I think you are creating the an enterprise version of Flux. Uh, we are not using, we are using boring SSL. We are not using the Microsoft thing because that one has many, many issues in my opinion. I mean, it's, you have to replace the Go tool chain on the Go Yes. The boring is SSL. One, sorry for interrupting. Is that one FIPS compliant? Because this is what we yeah. are doing for the other. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But that's Google. I'm guessing you'll never use that. That's a Google thingy. Yeah, boring okay. SSL is developed and maintained by Google, and being Google, they add it to the Go toolchain, so it's built in directly into Go. But I, I've seen that Microsoft is doing its own thing, and I think Red Hat also has its own, um, they switch the compiler uh, to their own stuff. It's, yeah, not easy to do that. Got it. Cool. Any other things? Uh, yes. But if nothing else from your side, just want to bring up the um, RFC or the um, uh, identity. Um, I think you, you commented in one of the sessions, you said that that particular RFC needs to be restarted or redone. Could you share more on where it's not meeting the, the bar? like what are you looking for because you need to really restart that fast to make it into the next release yeah so the problem with this rfc is that currently has no sponsors from the core team 
So first you need to find someone to sponsor it. From the core maintainers, right? Yeah. I see. And how how and, do you... uh, mm -hmm. maybe I don't know here it talks about many things, uh, including for example, um, GCP service account authentication, which is not actually OEDC. So someone needs to test out Asia, GCP, and GitHub and figure out if this proposal is actually good. Especially GCP, I'm very concerned about it, uh, given that we have a service account in the CPA. Got it. So, yeah, it from needs our... revised and tested mm -hmm. a little bit. And I'm not talking the ideas about the... there. Yeah, I'm not talking about the PR. I'm talking about the RFC, right? Not the PR. Just the. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking okay, about sorry, sorry. The... Yeah. Bear with me. I'm, you know, <laughs> making sure that I'm asking the right questions. Um... It's a pull request, but it's a pull request for uh, adding the RFC yes. to Flux, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, the I know. Code pull requests can be completely ignored because we shouldn't be doing code before, only after merging RFC. So that pull request will probably be closed okay. because it does many, many things, caching also, and you know, all sorts of things which should be done separately. I mean, the change is too huge and could impact everything that Flux does. It also caches tokens, it adds. GitHub app authentication, there are many things in there and no uh, tests for it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Cool. Coming back to RFC. Um, due to the way the feature is described, shall we start with all the, um, all the space, uh, manage identities, GCP, and you said uh, GitHub, or can we focus on manage identities because our partners would need manage identities. Do you care about the approach? Does it make any difference? Can we focus on manage identities integration? What manage workload identity? Uh, workload identity too. Oh, okay. The difference from our perspective is we call workload identity the federated identity where the service account tokens are exchanged for with um, AD tokens, for example, while the managed identities are literally the Azure managed identities, which are from, from our integration perspective are still made available on the cluster. But now that I talk about it, I realize that yes, from the open source perspective, you don't care about managed identities, you probably care about the workload identity. Uh, yeah, we are, we are caught in terminology. So what we rely on is on the same implementation as Kubernetes workload identity, where basically you use a cloud SDK, the Azure Go SDK. You have a service account that's assigned to the pod where source controller is running. And using the SDK, you, uh, you read the tokens which are mounted inside the pod. And with that token, you get an ephemeral authentication token through ADC, and then you can authenticate. So yes. in, in Kubernetes world, this is called workload identity, and yes. it's, a, it's a thing that's implemented across all, all cloud vendors. Uh, and we use it, so we have a current implementation for Azure Container Ready. What you are saying is that what we've implemented for Azure Container Registry and also Azure um, File Storage Blob storage. is what? Uh, yeah, I was just saying Blob Storage. Yeah, we have implemented uh, for that as well, right? Yeah. So that implementation is wrong, right? There is a new way of doing it. No, no, I just confused myself because, uh, again, like you said, the standard Kubernetes is workload identity. 
it exchanges tokens with valid identities, but yes, please disregard this. <laughs> uh, our, our partners are looking for using managed identities, but the way to use them is through workload identities. So that what you described is exactly what we are doing as well. Yeah, let me... In the docs. I'm going to paste the docs in here. So currently for Asia, we have Kubelet Manage Identity, which we called Workload Identity, where you have to add an annotation and label to the service account and also to the deployment. And we have an AD pod identity, which is deprecated. So what we call here workload identity, this is the latest, greatest way to authenticate, right? And this should be also enabled for Git repos. Mm -hmm. okay. Because the annotation is called Azure dot workload ident workload dot identity mm -hmm. client ID, so the terminology in Azure is also workload identity. It is. I'm it looking is. at the docs. Mm -hmm. No, no, okay. you're absolutely right. Yep. So this one is is up to date, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, so, oh, another question. Now that we are releasing Flux 2.2, can we delete from docs the AAD pod identity? Sure, that's a good one. <clears throat> from docs only? Oh, yeah. do, do we need to document the new way or the new way is already documented? So we have to, I, I pasted the link. We have two ways now authentication. One is called workload identity. One is called AD pod identity. So we can delete AD pod identity and only have workload identity left in, in the docs everywhere. Sounds good. And the code, we can delete the whole code in Q3. So first we remove the docs. We see if any, anyone screams. If no one screams in autumn, we can actually delete all the code that uh, was using AD pod identity. And hopefully we can replace it with workload identity for Git repos and everything else. Mm -hmm. cool. That's good. We're good. Okay. Um, from our team, Git Debug Meet, do we have enough clarity on what we need to do with the RFC to move it forward? Uh, yeah, so just one thing. So as Nicoletta, you mentioned, uh, so right now, uh, can we first focus on like uh, on on our partner us like getting azure workload like the workload identity to work with azure devops and later on then also implement uh, go for the gcp and all other providers as well or are we or it has to be done in sync for all of the uh, resource providers so the rfc has to include all mm -hmm then we can implement them one by one. We don't have to have a huge pull request that implements everything. That's what was tried before and it, it's it's no good, right? So mm -hmm. of course we, we we do the implementation for Azure first, let's say, or GitHub first or whatever yeah. we want to do first. But the specification has to include everything. 
Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Also, uh, you said that we need to have a maintainer assigned to this particular RFC, right? So is there a process of like requesting for a maintainer to join this so that we can interact with them and get it, get this moving? Yeah. So you should definitely open a discussion around this, a GitHub discussion. Okay. Right. And Say that, hey, or I don't know, you can also add a comment on the current RFC and say, hey, we want to take this over. Um, Sanskar is not that much around, so he'll not be able to move this forward. Uh, right, so you say, hey, we want to take this over. Who wants to sponsor it? We want to move it forward. We want to do the Azure implementation. Yeah. Okay, makes sense, perfect. Yeah, uh, other than that, like uh, if anyone else has uh, questions on this topic, go ahead. I have some other questions. No other questions. So we'll we'll do the we'll do the comment on the RFC, open the GitHub discussion, and we'll get it moving because I think it was already planned for the next release, two point three, and we'd like to try to make it in that one. Um, 2.4, not 2.3. Oh, 2.4, okay. Sorry. Yeah, end of this month, yeah. 2.4, yeah. which is September, right? No? Yeah, after Kubernetes 1.31. Okay. Do we always, so we follow Kubernetes release cadence. They do first the release, then we figure out how to upgrade to the next release. Uh, to the current Kubernetes release, then we have to do a release. So it's usually two, three weeks after the Kubernetes release, we, we do our own. Right? So we need to get everything um, ready, reviewed uh, in the week when Kubernetes does a release. So we have plenty of time to, to do the Azure DevOps implementation once we have the RFC ready. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Because the so the how how I see the the authentication bit source code is there. It's for ACR and being workload identity, right? Which is a generic way of authenticating to any kind of cloud service, it shouldn't require many code changes to the Git implementation. It shouldn't be too complicated. Everything is already there. The SDK is imported. We have the code that fetches the OEDC token, that refreshes the token, right? Everything is in place. Uh, we just need to wire the same code to the Azure DevOps bit. Okay, I'm done with this one, Bhavnit. Yeah, thanks, Nagrada. Uh, so the other things that I had uh, was one was the deprecation, deprecated versions, like for the uh, APIs, right? And even in the next 2.3, I believe uh, we're gonna uh, promote some of the APIs to version one. So uh, for the previous deprecated versions, as well as the one which will be deprecated in the upcoming Flux version, uh, are we gonna support it till all the API versions go to V1 and then deprecate them all together? Because yeah, that would be really helpful for us as well when we plan a major version so that we can just remove all of these uh, at once. So the deprecation and removals are documented in the roadmap. Uh, yeah, so it says yeah. that uh, it will be done, um, yeah, uh, in the quarter three, so all the deprecated APIs will be removed. Okay, so after the V1, right? Okay, then that helps, perfect. Uh, then um, the... Wait, 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 wait a second. So no, in Q3, we are removing APIs from three years ago. For example, uh, customization v1 beta 1 but we are not removing customization v1 beta 2 oh, okay mm -hmm. we are going to wait 
until the end of year to move that. So we said we will offer a six month window from deprecation to removal. Yeah. But given this is the first time we ever remove things, we are doing it slow, slower. Yeah. So in Q3, we are removing V1 beta one, which is ancient. It's like Flux was alpha back then. It's almost four years old. And only those are going to be removed. V1 beta two for customization and Git repository and bucket and everything else will still work. And we are going to remove those end of year. So, uh, yeah, so the 2.3 uh, version, which is going to be in May, uh, nothing's going to be removed in that. It's just the next quarter, which is the same one. The V1 beta one is removed. And by the December and V1, like when everything is promoted, everything will be removed. Okay, gradual. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, there are some APIs which will still remain in beta and uh, um, the OCI repository, for example, is, is still in, in uh, beta and we haven't yet decided when to go GA with it because the OCI spec is still evolving. So probably have to support OCI repository um v1 beta 2 for at least one year from now okay mm -hmm. perfect thanks uh so yeah apart from this uh there was one thing about the cv fixes like uh i was just uh, thinking like currently how do we actually um like we are planning to build a pipeline as well, but uh, even if we use uh, Trivi pack, uh, Trivi to scan packages and uh, identify the vulnerabilities and all, so uh, it can identify a lot of like if you're using Helm or uh, Go packages which are not actually used by Flux. So is there a process in which we uh, go around identifying like yeah which package is actually affecting it and like how do we implement it and what is the SLA for Flux like um, for high, medium or low and stuff like that if we have it somewhere uh, documented. What do you mean SLA for an open source project? Uh, just like SLA. if there's a... Um, vulnerability reported like a like a cv and stuff like that so what's like the normal sla for uh, uh fixing it and uh announcing it publicly something like that zero we can, we can call we it are the volunteers here point. there is no sla <laughs> okay. what do you mean <laughs> no, there is no the, yes yes let's call it the best effort like what would be the best effort uh, at, um, timeline for fixing things so if it's a if it's a CV in flux, we try to fix it as soon as possible. We do a patch release for it without announcing the CV. We wait at least two weeks after we do the patch release. Then we make the CV public through um, GitHub. Uh, vulnerability disclosure page. Then the Panda bot picks it up and everybody is notified about it. But it's already a patch version available for Flux. Uh, so they can, they should have upgraded or if they didn't upgrade, they had the choice to upgrade. Now there are no guarantees around backporting. We guarantee that, yes, if we find a CV, we are trying to make a patch for the current version. And backporting for some things, it could be possible if, let's say, the dependencies are all in check. So let's say there is a CV in Flux and the fix implies um, upgrading also Kubernetes. We can't go back to a previous version of upgrade Kubernetes because all the other dependencies will fail, right? Helm depends on Kubernetes, Cosine depends on Kubernetes and so on, right? So it's impossible to fix it unless we upgrade all the previous versions, which is huge work and there is no one to do it. 
right? So, there is, so the the whole idea of having SLA is like forget about it. There is no SLA, uh, but we try our best to uh, create a patch version for the current version, and of course include the fix in the next minor version, right? So we do a patch for the current minor version, and we that fix also gets into the next minor version, dot zero. So people don't necessarily have to upgrade to a next minor. They can just apply the patch, which is uh, usually backwards compatible with that minor version. Now, there are cases where in order to patch a CV, and that was um, the case two years ago with uh, uh, with a CV in customized controller where in order to patch it, I had to rewrite the whole way of how Flux applies resources on the cluster. So for that, there was no backport, no nothing. There was no patch release because I rewrote basically the whole of Flux to fix it. That was when we switched to using kubectl to apply things to having our own implementation of server-side applied. So there is also the case where a, a CV fix comes with a breaking change and there is no way around it. It, it depends on where the CV is found and how, how bad it is. Perfect. Thanks, Stefan. Also, uh, is there a, like, there are some CVs that are reported by users, okay? But, uh, uh, like, is there a pipeline that we already have that uh, actually scans for it and, like, uh, we do proactively uh, uh, fix those vulnerabilities? Or uh, is it just reported or and only those are the ones that get fixed right away as of now? So for CVs in the container image, or yep. in some dependency. Uh, we are aware of it because we Docker sponsors us and we have Docker Scout enabled on the Flux organization. So what we do every month, we look at we look at those and we see if anything there actually affects Flux or not. If it affects Flux, we are going to try and do a release for it. Mm -hmm. If it affects Flux, usually we also register a CV in Flux for it. And then we think I have an example for this. Also, I read it in the documentation somewhere about, uh, in the Flux documentation itself, about using Trivi to scan pack, uh, images and all that. So is that actually readily used uh, to find vulnerabilities up, uh, with uh, along with uh, what you mentioned right now, or is it just the doc? No, scan? we so before we use 3D scan mm -hmm. it in, in a GitHub action, but now we have Docker Scout, so we don't need to run anything. Docker Scout automatically um, does the, the scanning on its own continuously. We don't have to have some cron job with 3D to run it, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess they use the same databases uh, behind. So we no longer run the 3 v um, job. We recommend users. Th that's what the documentation say. We we tell user, hey, uh, users, hey, use 3 v because that's a free thing. You don't have to pay for it. And it's quite good, right? But we no longer do that because now we have a service that's, you know, not paid for because you don't pay it sponsored but it does it for us continuously. So we, we don't need to run uh, 3V in, in, in the Flux uh, organization anymore. Oh, perfect, thanks. So look, here is one example. DCV. So the story with DCV is that OSS has found a problem in, in Helm, in Helm SDK. We looked at our usage of Helm SDK. We determined that this vulnerability in Helm SDK actually affects Flux. 
you can DDoS the Helm controller suite and Helm created their own CV. We created our own CV. All right, so this is an example of a CV in our depend in one of our dependencies. It's actually in a hot path. We actually are vulnerable to the same thing, and we decided to create a, a CV for it if it's really serious. Now, last month there was a CV in Helm where someone can craft a Helm chart and Helm, the CLI, will write everywhere on your file system, which is very serious if you run Helm CLI on your machine. It can override anything. But this CV is not that serious for Flux. Why? Because Flux runs with a read-only root file system. So in our case, something in a Helm chart can't override um, OS binaries, can't mess up the operating system, it can't, you know, touch the Flux binary itself because all of all of that file system is read-only. The only thing that you can do is write to the temporary directory that already gets cleaned up by Flux after it does the reconciliation. After the reconciliation finishes, Flux always deletes everything in the temp directory. So yes, it can write anywhere in the temp directory. Do we care about it? Is actually a vulnerability that can impact Flux? Not really. <laughs> So we didn't create a, a, a CV for that because we, we thought, okay, it's, it's quite serious if you run it on your own machine, but due to the fact that Flux runs in a container, container has a bunch of security around it, the root file system is read-only, that thing does not actually affect us. That's kind of the analysis that we, we do when either Dependabot or uh, the, the Docker Scout scanner uh, tells us, hey, there is this vulnerability found in a container image of Flux. Okay, we are at time. Any other questions? Yeah, but we can uh, take them next time. So one is, uh, do we have some processes for backlog uh, scrubbing or anything? Because we, we have this team here ready to work on Flux. Would like to know what's coming up, how can we contribute more concretely, have some idea of the roadmap for ourselves, right? Because again, we are also having driving internal projects and, and uh, have roadmaps and you know, it would be helpful to know what we'll be doing in the next three months, six months and so on. We are going to, so after we do the, minor release we have to figure out all the features that are going into 2.4 and we can discuss there uh, maybe microsoft can help us with some um, things right and we can um, assign issues to mm -hmm. members from your team so mm -hmm. other contributors will know that okay Help is not needed here. Someone is taking care of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can we can definitely after in May after we we finish two point three we can create some issues, assign them to your team. So it's it's so you have it in your own backlog. That's that's what you are asking, right? <laughs> Basically, you want to know what. What yeah, things... we need to have some some roadmap yeah. as well, which is yeah. concrete, and you know we know what we'll be doing, and we know what to expect in some amount of time. The usual yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you consider having some again some small backlog scrub at the beginning of these meetings, like ten minutes, one maybe once we establish this is the backlog, continue to have some, you know, let's look at issues or this kind of form. Yeah, we had that at some point. Maybe we can uh, redo it. We, some point we use the GitHub project at the org level. So mm -hmm. you can add issues there from all the repos. We yeah. still have the project. 
so we can use it. Yeah, we can uh, revive it. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, the roadmap is the backlog. Yes, the roadmap mm -hmm. um, has actual links to issues, mm -hmm. which are maybe not specific issues, are more about an umbrella issue that, you know, mm -hmm. like, okay, we need to implement this feature and that means we have to work on all these areas. Mm -hmm. Create this package, um, you know, uh, extend the API in this controller, integrate it in other controller and so on. Um, so first we need to have these umbrella issues there. Then we can add the, the um, you know, the tasks to the GitHub project mm -hmm. of that. Probably that will be uh, easier to go over in meetings because there are more scoped uh, issues. Okay. Yeah, I was talking to Lucky and he said he can help. He can join us for the next session and he can, you know, show how we can do that in some efficient manner. If you want, I can have him joining next time. For some project management. Uh, not next time after the release. It's uh, we are really really busy with the release. I know and I can't think about other things. Yes. Okay. To the release. So after after we have two point three out, mm -hmm. maybe we can do a dedicated meeting around uh, backlog management only, and have lucky there. Okay. That that cool. works as well. Uh, but for, until then, again, feel free to tell us what we can do to help. Uh, because again, we have deep debug need ready to work on things which are important for the project, not necessarily for us. And uh, okay. that's that. And you got your Azure subscription, right? Because but Lucky said he no, no, he was not no. able to give you one. Okay, I'll talk to him again. Yeah, I told him. So he has, he can, he said he can give us a um, uh, account key, mm -hmm. but we can't use that because Azure DevOps, you can't provision Azure DevOps repos. You mm -hmm. need access. You need an actual account and login into the UI mm -hmm. uh, to set up something beforehand. Sun is not here. He's coming back in two weeks. He, he knows all the details around that. And he told me like, we really need an account. We have to log in into the portal. Mm -hmm. uh, also to verify that whatever we are creating, we also destroy and, and, and other things that I have no clue about it. But he said, we need an account, an actual account. Mm -hmm. I told that to Lucky and that, that was, that was the end of it. I don't know if he can provision that to us or what was the problem there. I didn't mm -hmm. ping him because Sunny is away, and even if he gives me something, I don't know how to test it. Mm -hmm. um, but when Sunny is back in two weeks, maybe we can have a meeting with 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 you again and Sunny and figure out a way for to enable the end to end test. Got it. Okay, then I'll start tracking this again. I thought it was handled. Yeah. Um, because we would also like to see, I think you say you'll be doing conformance on Google and whatever, you want to add Azure then as well, of course, like re-enable those. But um, yeah, need to give it the support. Yeah, so for mm -hmm. for the next release, is definitely clear that we'll not have those running. So I will ping you and your team when we have the, before we actually do the release, when we have the images ready and uh, uh, new CRDs, so you can actually do the test on Asia on your own uh, mm -hmm. before the release, not after. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So if we have issues, we uh, we don't release it and we fix them. I have a question. Uh, for the next few yeah. years, Jack Pitt and Jason have implemented the notation verification. So now this will be part of the next release, but Jason was working also into adding into the CLI a command that we call flux create secret. And this command is supposed to create 
the, the secret containing all the configuration to do the verification with not notation. So you will have the trust policy and identities that are needed in order to perform the verification. So I would like to have this into the next release as well. So we, we can ship everything all together. Um, I think Jason this week, but he didn't reply. Can you maybe see with him whether it can be done next week so we can make sure to test it and have it as well? Sure. Is that, um, does Jeffrey know about it? Sorry, I, I. Jason, yeah. He knows, right? His name is Jason. Yeah, I think Tech Pete as well knows about it. Okay, I'll, I'll chat, chat with him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jason is not in the ARC team. Yes. Oh. Yes. He's okay. not, right? No, he's not. He's, he's not. Okay. containers or, or anyway, another mm -hmm. team. Maybe, like, can you give uh, can you give Nicoletta the issue so mm -hmm. she knows yeah, the once again. number of the cluster? Yes, I'm, I'm in touch with Jason as well. If uh, we'll we'll see, we'll see who's more available to do what you are asking. Yeah, so we uh, around uh, notation. Sule has wrote the docs. That showing the command is not this one. implemented. So it's we need to know if Jason can do it. No one from Microsoft can can help with the CLI stuff. We'll do it because we can't release something that doesn't have the counterpart in the yeah, exactly. But the thing is so, that he has started working on it. So I just we need to know whether he can finish it or have to step up. And finish it ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. Ideally, we shall be able to do so. I'll let you know. I'll track it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Cool. Okay. We are over time. I need to go. Yeah, but I have uh, one last. I have one last topic, mostly for you, Stefan. Uh, go go it, fast. The, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you earlier. Uh, there is. I put it in the in the deck as uh, as well. There's a new uh, pull request that want to enable. Uh, then it want to enable for the value side. So in Helm, when you have a Helm job, you can oh skipping the values. Set, you can, yeah, you can set the values file so that can be used instead of the values of YAML, or you can merge them together. And there's a new protocol that wants to be able to skip the values. And this means that we will have a new field in the Helm chart API for skipping the values. I don't see any issue with that, but at the moment, what we do is when we when we build the Helm chart, we package it and we say that the Helm chart is ready, we have a summary that tells you that when the hand shot is ready, it means that all the values in your values file have been merged as well. If you can skip those, it means that we have to change the summary somehow. But it is a bit tricky because when we do the merging, if we already have a hand chart package and we have a new version, we make sure that we merge the values the old and new version somehow. So this is a bit tricky. So I'm looking at it. But I guess my question is more about, can we do this for this version coming next uh, in two weeks or do we want to postpone it into for 2.4? So I, I had a, a look at this and I don't see a, I mean, maybe I, I have a wrong understanding of Helm, but you can have a values.yaml with the, the, the file can exist and have all the values commented up and it will work, right? Yeah. Just because the file is there, we don't set any values. Yeah. We only use the Helm release values and it, 
it should work, right? Yeah. So if that works, this pull request should have no issues going in, right? Because we don't risk introducing any breaking change. It's like having a Helm chart with values.yaml with nothing inside. Now we have a Helm chart with not values.yaml. But in the end for Helm controller, it it doesn't matter, right? It it shouldn't, in my mind, it shouldn't affect things. Like what you said that we are merging the values from the previous version, that's never the case, right? What we do is we retrieve the previous version. We make sure that in the previous version, so when we retrieve the previous version at the moment today in the implementation, we retrieve the previous version. And if you retrieve the previous version and we see that in the spec, it's written that the values file, it means that the previous, in the previous version, the values file were retrieved and merged. Now, if you can skip those, if you can skip those, it means that in the previous version, it was already skipped if the spec hasn't changed. But then that means as well that we have to somehow figure in we need the status that say that it was skipped in the previous version as well. Otherwise, we said that everything was merged in the previous version, but in the new version we have, it can be skipped. You see the difference? Yeah, we need to persist That's the possible. setting in the state like we do, for example, with, with signature verification and other things, right? So we we have to know, like we do with the history in Helm, in Helm release, right? Yeah. So that yeah, might this complicate, this that complicates might complicate things. things. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> I I need to look okay. at it a bit more, but I think it's not just like let's say just keep it and it's fine because we we post the right, previous right, version. Right. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Okay, I will I will look at it again. I I I totally missed the the history importance for it. Yeah, I'm I'm not saying no to it today. <laughs> Maybe next week. <laughs> I'll, I'll, no, I, what, I'll, 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 what I don't think we should say no. I'm just saying like no for this release. Yeah, no for this release. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll have a look and we can discuss it next next week again. Good. Okay. Good. Right. Okay. Thanks everyone. I'm uh, Thanks. out. Bye.